Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, for today we're going to talk about finding the pain points in uh, Loden Hall in a mining production system. I think, first of all, I'd just like to welcome and thank uh, all of you who are attending. Uh, I know we've had very busy schedules, and over the last two years of COVID, most of us are now done with doing everything virtually. So, so we do really appreciate uh, your attendance. Listen to us. So today, uh, myself, Roger Lamson, and uh, Kurt Pigeon will be taking you through the webinar today. Um, we, there is a Q&A uh, section. We'll get to that at the end of the presentation or might pick up some of the questions as we, we go. Um, and we also might uh, ask you to put some comments and thoughts in the chat. And in addition, we'll be doing two polls uh, to get your inputs during the, the discussions. So let me introduce myself. I'm Roger Lamson, started my career back in mining R&D for about 11 or 12 years, then spent uh, a similar amount of time with a large multinational uh, GE in various businesses. And then later for the latter part of my career, I came back to the mining space. And over the th past 13 years, I've worked for Bucyrus, for Caterpillar, Barlow World in the mining equipment space. And I'm now with uh, Decoder. So let me uh, pass hand you over to Kurt so he can introduce himself. I'm based in Johannesburg and Kurt is based in Queensland, Australia. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kurt Pigeon and I'm the Analytics and Technology Manager for Decoder. Um, as Roger just suggested, yeah, I'm based in Queensland, Australia and I coordinate our digital development and the mining specialist teams with an end goal to embed sustainable improvements within our clients' operations. So that's that's me in a nutshell. So thanks, Roger. I'll pass on right, to you. Thanks, yourself. Kurt. Okay, so for the agenda today, I'll first uh, lay out the context about mining productivity and lost productivity, then just talk in general terms about data analytics. Um, then we'll specifically go into load and haul loss productivity. How do you use analytics to optimize load and haul performance? Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, Dakota. Uh, on how we do, uh, you know, manage load and haul and address improvements. Um, and then Kurt will take us through a couple of, of real case study examples, and then we'll just come back to things at the end for the summary. So setting the context uh, for productivity um, in mining, there are a number of macro factors with the, which have the potential to impact or drive the need for improved productivity. There's the cyclic nature of mining. There's the fluctuations in commodity price. We've seen that here um, before in, 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 in previous years, five years ago or six years ago, I forget the exact date, which was a real disaster. Many mines were underwater. And then, more in, and it's becoming more and more of, uh, important now, the environmental and social expectations. So these factors can collectively impact a mine's financial performance which can result in some of the mines being marginal or loss making, which impacts cash flow, erodes shareholder holder, uh, value and confidence and makes it harder to get uh, financing. A study by McKinsey in recent years suggests that globally, the mining industry has lost productivity valued at $350 billion a year which I'm sure you'll all agree is a huge number. And I think that's, that's if you take one thing away from the presentation today, I think that's really it, that $350 billion are lost annually in productivity. So hence, there's the strategic drive needed for improved mining productivity. So the question is, how do we recapture um, lost value? So here we have a view of the mining value chain. Uh, you can see it's based in, in silos. Um, mining is a, is a really complex process. There's lots of variables, lots of things affect the, affect the way things happen. Nothing is uniform. And so what has developed over the years is this approach to managing everything in these specific silos. Good to do that because you can optimize performance of certain silos, but it's also not um, entirely best benefit for the whole mining production system as a whole. What is also needed is an integrated a uh, system where the performance can be managed across the silos. Because often, uh, you know, one silo might have specific KPIs which are not consistent with, with some of the other silos and that can have a big impact down the value chain. And a good one, which people often quote, 
is uh, you know drill and blast if you get that piece wrong so you might blast all the material you're supposed to blast and have those uh, BCMs done but uh, if it's badly blasted it has a major impact all the way down the value chain so hence the need for for two things you need deep level of expertise uh, in managing each of the silos and you also need a method to manage across the silos so today we're really going to just focus on one of those those silos which is load and haul so changing gear let's talk a little bit about data analytics so us as individuals use it in our personal lives every single day. And, and I've just thrown up a couple of quick examples. The one which is often used uh, on the right there is, is Google Maps or Waze or any of those, those, those uh, GPS um, apps. Uh, so it saves us a huge amount of time. I never go anywhere in Joburg without using, using one of these. Another one is Strava, which is an app used for fitness. Lots of fitness fanatics, I'm sure, are very, very familiar with that great analytics in a tool which is which is totally free and it's used uh, every time i go out for a ride i encourage you not to look at those numbers closely because they're not very good but uh, the, the data analytics is there and then on the last two on the left hand side of that chart are both weather apps so i fly model airplanes typically on a saturday afternoon so these days i have an app which shows me what the wind and weather conditions going to be like during the day every uh, you know, three hours uh, or so. So so I can make a decision on Monday whether it's going to be a good flying day on, on Saturday. I think the key point I'm really trying to make here is that we use analytics in our daily lives uh, all the time, and, and we should really be making much more use of it in mining. So, so although these apps look very simple and there's one page there, there's a huge amount of data behind each of those. When it comes to achieving best potential performance, there's a lot that we in mining can learn from the Formula One community. For F1 is really the gold standard in analytics in driving best potential performance. So if you're a real Formula One nerd, just like me, you probably already know all of this, but every F1 car contains 300 sensors, which generate 1.1 million data points per second and is transmitted back to the uh, to the pits, uh, from the cars back to the pits. The t telemetry data is really critical for the teams, particularly in pre-season testing and practice and, and, and qualifying. And the three main reasons for that are, number one is to visualize the feedback. So a driver will be saying that the car's not feeling so great through this corner, it's understeering, oversteering, or whatever it's doing. And then the engineers can then take a look at the data to see what's happening and then make the necessary changes. It also gives a method for comparing performance. So how do you compare to your teammate? Where is your teammate getting a couple more, you know, tenths of a second or, or hundredths of a second through the various corners? And, and where are those areas you need to focus on to, to improve the performance? And also it can be used to compare against the other teams. And then also highly critical is, um, you know, from a reliability perspective, every single a system on that car has is 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 has sensors on it which go back to the pits so changes can be made on the fly for example depending on your fuel consumption you might have to reduce some of the settings so that you achieve optimum performance and end the end of the race so in f1 analytics is really the cornerstone of achieving best potential performance f1 is a very big business but when you start looking at f1 and you compare it to to mining, it really comes into perspective. So I've pulled out some numbers here. In Formula One, in 2021, the total revenues in Formula One was $2.14 billion. In 2021, the mining revenues were $1.8 trillion. So essentially a thousand times bigger. So really the question is, why are analytics not used in mining to the same extent as they are in F1? In our view, they really should be. If we look now, um, look now at um, mining system, mining system of the future. You know, so what does the mine of the future look like? And I think some mines are already heading in this this direction. I'm aware of a, a few of them that are doing that. But essentially, the mine of the future is a fully, you know, technology mine, digitized mine. So all the way through from 
all the geological data being digitized, every single piece of equipment will have sensors on it, providing data back to, to a cloud, uh, you know, for the analytics. Um, uh, you know, uh, there'll be, be drones which will be used for, you know, for, which are currently already used for, for survey and for establishing how things are performing. Autonomous equipment is already coming into its own in lots of places. And then also the mine will establish a digital twin. So you'll have a digital version of the mine. And I know uh, it, it is already happening in a, in a couple of places, but very sparsely, I think, where you can look at different what if scenarios to, to say, so what if I do this, how will that improve the performance of the overall, overall system? So this might be the mine of the future. And what we'd really like to do at this point is, is stop for a poll. So if Google, you can pull that uh, poll up. So really we're asking you two questions here. Where do you feel your mining businesses, business is in terms of maturity and capturing data from operations? And the second one is if you do capture that, does your mining business actually use the analytics to drive decision-making in operations? So if Google, if we can just pull up that poll. Okay, so I hope most of you have uh, completed the poll and it'd be great if you could share the, the, the result with us, Google. Okay, so maybe let me just chat, chat to these numbers and then I'll also just ask um, uh, Kurt for, for, for his thoughts. So, so I think the, we've got a bit of a mixed response. Um, so some at, at, at the top end, there are a couple of operations. Uh, so they're using it across all the operations. But I think the interesting thing in being used across all operations, they're not all you know, using the analytics to the full capability. But I think the general opinion here in our market of people on the call is that um, data is available only in limited areas of the operation and it's only used in limited areas of operation. And maybe Kurt, I can uh, pass this over to you. How does that uh, sort of sound to you how does that compare to to your market possibly yeah look this this is very um a, a standard i guess response for for most markets that there is varying uh, degrees of how much it's used and how much it's not you know you're always going to have a new mine site or or, uh, or an experienced mine site that might use it a little bit more um but overall you know that the, the, to say that across a few limited areas of the operation um you know that that was calling out in that question one there that's very common. That's that's exactly what I would expect. Um, it's it's not being used everywhere. It does get used some places, and and it's because of that that we're all on this call here today because we hear the value of it in, in a few areas. So, and and again, the question one and question two both across a few limited areas of the operation reflecting that. So, what we want to do or what we're expanding to do is is not just look at those few limited areas. What has been done in the past a lot is is look at just one machine and Roger will probably talk this a little bit more and I will as well. Um, but we're, instead of looking at say one dump truck, looking at a whole circuit, looking at it from wider and then stepping out from that again and looking at across the mining value chain, uh, similar to that what you see on the screen there now. So um, really, really good um, responses though. Thanks. Great. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for that, uh, Kurt. So, so moving on, let's uh, start looking at uh, load and haul uh, and, and loss productivity specifically in, in, in load and haul. So if we look at the value chain um, in, 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 in mining value chain in, 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 in the whole mining production system, so the first four elements of that mining value chain 
are really the, 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 the mineral extraction, getting the stuff out of the ground. So, uh, and that's very similar for every single open cast or, or surface mine that there is very similar. There's a few differences in some places. Some people might use dozers, whatever, but if, essentially we have drill and drill, then followed by blasting, then followed by a loader, loading a truck fleet. The truck fleet then transports the material to a dump or to a uh, run of mill, run of mine, stockpile or, or, or to, a, to a crusher. Uh, and then on the, the right hand side, the, the processing of the material varies a lot. Might be very minimal processing in some, some materials, uh, some of the bulk materials, iron ore and coal, there is some processing obviously, but might be minimal processing. And in other, other products, there's, there's major processing. So you look at any of the precious metals, platinum, uh, gold, you know, there's a whole complex, expensive process which probably happens at that particular stage. But I think we really just focus on the, the mineral extraction, which is the, the four. And, and, and um, the actual cost involved in each of those stages, uh, I've got a pie chart there, which um, and the source is, is, is provided there, Bagapur, which was some work which was done quite a while ago, but I think it's fairly... Uh, you know, pertinent to today's um, numbers. And if you combine haulage and loading, put those two together, there's 80% of your costs in getting, you know, mining the minerals. So, so that's really, I think, why we, you know, big focus around, uh, you know, load and haul today. And that's really why we, 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 we're talking about that. So, so maybe um, just a question here. For those of you who are at mines, this number here, this 80% um, load and haul cost in terms of the mine extraction, is that what you find in your areas? Is that typical? If you've got any thoughts on that, it'd be good if you can just put that into the chat. So if we uh, go on to a load and haul production system, Kurt alluded to it, that it needs to be looked at as a complete production system. No use focusing on a, a couple of trucks, you know, to try and, you know, optimize them or no use focusing on just the loader. What this is, is it's a, it's a, a production circuit, a production system, much like you'd have in a factory. And it needs to be viewed as that. So when you're looking at how to optimize the performance of a load and haul production system, you need to look at the whole system as a whole. So if we have a look at this example here. So these are all averages taken over quite a you know, long period of time. In the bottom left corner, we have a loader, which is loading a truck. Uh, takes a certain amount of time. All those numbers there are in minutes. Um, it then takes, uh, the truck then moves um, to the dump or wherever it's going. It's got a queue time at the dump uh, for a short period of time. It then dumps material, takes a certain amount of time then goes on a return haul back to the shovel. It sits in a queue for a while. It then spots and it then loads, loads again. So I think it's a, in this circuit, there are lots of areas, uh, you know, lots of phases of the operation, lots of place areas where, uh, you know, you can get variability and lose performance. So I think the real key takeaway from this is it, it is a complex system. You need to look at a systemized approach at looking at load and haul. And that's the way in which you can go about optimizing. So on the so in that previous slide, um, I'm sure you guys uh, in the mining space are familiar with many of the pain points that you have in load and haul. Um, I've thrown a few up on the screen. It's not a, a inclusive list. I'm not going to go through through all of them. So operator performance, big variable, you know, the machines operate 24 seven, their night shifts, you know, so how does that operator performance vary across, you know, the day, different operators are better than others. So that has a big impact on performance. Um, loader and truck uh, matching. So if your load is not exactly matched to your truck, it doesn't load it to the correct amount easily. So it ends up taking you longer to load and you get a much bigger payload variability. The bottom right there, blasted material fragmentation. I mentioned that earlier. That's a really a good one to talk about because often there's not enough focus at that first part of the value chain, which is, which is, which is done, which ends up affecting, you know, the rest of the value chain hugely. So in load and haul, if you don't have well blasted material with bad fragmentation, the, the loader's struggle to, to, to load the material. And I have seen this in lots and lots of, uh, you know, mining, mine sites and applications, they struggle 
to, to load the material. So you don't get, uh, it takes a long time to do it. It's also the bucket doesn't get properly filled. So you need to do more pass loads than you really need to have to, have to do. And also with the variability in the bucket full, you end up with the huge variabilities of payloads on the trucks. So those are really just a, a, a few examples. And again, I'm gonna stop here um, and, 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 and do a poll. Um, but I think the key here is what we're trying to do and what we, uh, alluding to is there's so many different aspects which affect uh, load and haul performance. The, the key is which are the ones that you must focus on so you can achieve the best production output of the total system. So if we're looking at load and haul in a this is a poll question, Google, I can ask you to bring it up again. So what percentage improvement opportunity is there for load and haul performance in your operations. So again, those of you who are in operations, just give it your, your thought. If you're not directly in operations, just give it an estimate. So how much percentage improvement do you think you'll be able to get out of uh, load and haul performance? And, and while, um... We're taking a moment on that too. Feel free to put in the chat um, for everyone online. Um, what other pain, pain points do you see within your operations? Um, if you want to throw into the chat any other thoughts or, or ideas or areas that um, areas of focus for, for your operations, that'd be interesting to see as well. And we, we can try to respond to that and how analytics can help that. Or any other questions for that matter. Right. Okay, so I'll just give you another 15 seconds, if you like, just to um, respond. And then Google, if once that time's up, you can just pop up the, the results so we can talk a little bit to that and see what, what the general comments and thoughts are. Okay, so I think varied results here. Um, so nobody said that uh, there is no opportunity to improve there. Um, and then I guess there's again a mixed bag. The, 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 the biggest number, I guess, is between the 11 and 20% mark. Um, but again, a little bit of a, a, a distribution. Any thoughts and uh, comments there, uh, Kurt? Yeah, look, this is a hard question to answer because you don't know what you don't know. Um, but it is not uncommon for, for people to be acutely aware that, um, and you can see 60% of people here in those in the bottom two there, um, with the highest amount of opportunity available to them. Every, we all know it's there. Um, we see the symptoms of it every day, um, trying to find it, trying to find that root cause, trying to, and quite often we see that root cause as well, how to deliver that through, how to, to take that from that, that first insight through to, an improvement opportunity that, that is a sustained improvement uh, over time is a, is a real challenge. And um, I know I'll talk to that a bit more in a second, but um, but yeah, no, that, that it's very um, normal numbers, I would suggest across any mining landscape. Okay. But I think the real point takeaway is, is I think in, in general, we believe that there's, 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 there's good opportunities to improve performance in load and haul. Great, thanks, Scott. Okay, so what does industry research um, show us covering tens of thousands of, of load and haul cycles? So we've done a lot of analysis in all sorts of different uh, commodities, uh, you know, from coal to iron ore, to some precious metals, et cetera. So, so, so there are three key uh, themes that stand out for us. So the one is, is high variability. And, I, and we've also alluded to this, you know, in the earlier discussion. Uh, operators, big variability across operators, uh, you know, big variability along, along payloads, big variability along, you know, travel time, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's an enormous amount of variability which happens also within the shift and also across shifts, et cetera. So that's the one aspect that you see. And, and I think as everyone knows in any production system, like if you've got a production system in a factory or a production cell somewhere, 
variability is something you want to you want to minimize because variability is not a friend of of getting optimum production and i think the other impact is when you've got a um, a whole lot of silos connected in a value chain if you've got a lot of variability in the silo it has a knock-on effect all the way down through the value chain. The next uh, area I think which is quite interesting is there's a significant improvement potential. We see this on all of the circuits that we, we analyze. So, so essentially when it's, um, machines are sold to a mine, you know, uh, the, the, based on the throughput, et cetera, the, the, the equipment is designed to fit, fit for purpose. And a shovel will have a capability of doing maybe 3,000 tons an hour or 2,000 tons an hour. Uh, etc. So, um, it's, so it's, it's got a specific capability. But what we actually find is that in, in mining operations, in most uh, of those production uh, systems, production circuits, that the equipment is not achieving its best potential if you take this target value as its best potential. I think we found in extremely good operations, you might be getting 85% of best potential. But in many operations, you know, 50% around that lower number is, 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 is not uncommon and anything between that and, and 80. So, so, so there's always a significant improvement potential. And the other one I think is quite an interesting one is, and this is again goes back to the need to analyze the, the circuit as a system, is that KPIs, um, which are chosen, sometimes drive adverse outcomes. Not going to go into it in a lot of detail here. Yeah, Kurt has got a case study example where a mine focused just about, you know, really focused its, its, its production circuits on, you know, achieving tons in, in the truck, you know, get it to its optimum tons, whether it's 300 tons or whatever the number is, and focus everything on that. And, and although they got very good figures out in achieving their 300 tons uh, and the variability was low on that, it had an impact on on the production circuit. So I think the key point to take away here is there's always opportunity for improvement in, 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 in uh, load and haul. Hey Roger, we've had a couple of uh, comments come through as well, mate, um, around pain points, uh, really encouraging. So equipment utilization is absolutely a pain point on mine site we've had there. Um, and one I really like, which we didn't cover there before, mining and plant interface. So how they, they interact with each other. And I, I really like this, <clears throat> pardon me. I really like this, this one um, a lot because it's like I said before, we're so entrenched in looking at the KPIs and the, and the, the you know, um, like payload, as Roger just sort of alluded to there, um, and looking at that one machine. And instead, we've got to look at this as a business unit and expand that out and, and how those machines interact together and how various silos through the business interact together. So mining and plant interfaces is a really good point. Um, Alex said, I think the more moisture there is in the ore, the more fine stuff will stick to the loader bucket and truck pan, thus reducing capacity. Absolutely, you got to hang up in your truck bodies. Um, moisture is important in dust alloying, so a fine balance is needed. That's a really good point, um, that one. Measuring that can be a challenge um, without the right tools on site. Um, but those tools do exist. Um, I'm not going to expand on that into this one because we've got a couple of case studies lined up already but um that's that's really good um Wingle also agrees at high and correct uh also dusty conditions during loading so that environmental factor we all i'm sure we've all heard that environmental is a big thing these days um and another one around um how do we measure variability um you know it really depends on um on the situation um and what we're trying what problem we're trying to solve for that client um, operator variability is, is a, you know, a clear winner, um, but there's many ways to measure variability on site and there's almost any KPI that you want to pick out there that, um, that can be taken into a variability account and, and done over like a histogram where we measure it in buckets and, and measure that out and, and, um, and the important gain with that is not increased, not aiming to increase, for example, payload and I will go through that later. Um, but trying to narrow it down so it doesn't damage the truck, it doesn't, it doesn't underload, and, and instead we're doing the right things at the right time. So I'll, um, we'll, we'll expand on that later, but really good comments there, thanks. Um, I'm not sure, Roger, if you wanted to say anything to them or we'll skip on the next one, mate. No, I think you've covered those nicely. Thanks very much, Kurt, and thanks for uh, keeping an eye on that, uh, on, the on the questions and, and the chat. So thank you, for, thanks, thanks for that. 
All right. Um, so how do you use analytics to optimize load and haul uh, performance? Um, and really, I guess this is the, the nub of what um, our, our, our discussion is all about. Next slide. Good. All right. So, I mean, the key thing is how do you identify the pain points? Where does it hurt? So we've seen already that there are lots of places uh, in the load and haul circuit. You know, we came up with a few team on, you know, and uh, webinar also came up with a few. So, so, so in order to measure those pain points, you really need to measure the performance of the load and haul circuit. So there's lots of ways to measure the performance of the load and haul circuit. You can go and do a production study, send a few people in, you know, have a look and see how things go, track, track information, etc. And then you get a snapshot of performance there. But I think uh, in going back to the whole thing of, of data and analytics, all of the equipment that currently comes out of, of OEMs um, is capable of transmitting a, a lot of really, really good data. It's already there it's, and, and it's already being captured by uh, most of the OEMs and all of the mines have access to that, that data. So you can capture the performance of every single uh, item, which is, you know, has a telematics on it, uh, you know, every minute, hour, you know, day, week, year, you can get a full, uh, you know, set of, 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 of data. So, so, so that is really the best way of measuring load and haul, uh, you know, performance. So you do a circuit analysis, much like we showed um you know that that graphically or uh, earlier and you can do a full analysis and then based on that uh, you can then sort of see where the performance how is the performance of that circuit uh, you know compared to what it was really designed to do and then once that's done you can then determine what those low hanging fruit so where are the key things to focus on should i be focusing on payload variability should i be focusing on you know travel time what should i really be focusing on here should i be focusing on operators of the trucks operators of the you know of, of the shovel etc so it really uh, gets gets you um you know the opportunity to find those those points so you can head in the direction of best potential performance so let's um talk a little bit about uh, dakota so the way we we approach it uh, load and haul optimization so we've essentially in our load and haul tools, we've got three modules. So the, the one we are really talking about today is operate for productivity. We also have um, operate for reliability. So that's making sure that machines are not abused. So what are all roads like, uh, for example, on the machines, you know, operators not treating the machines in the correct way, uh, too many, you know, big loads coming through. Uh, etc what's the machine health looking like so 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 how do you uh, you know make the machines as reliable as possible so that's a module we're not talking about that today and then we've also got short interval control which is about you know how do you make adjustments to your productivity within the shift so so the difference really between operate for productivity the module we'll be talking today is that looks a more strategic look at your um, load and haul productivity so we look off over look at productivity over days, weeks, and months, and see what the general trend is and where are those opportunities to make general strategic changes in productivity. And then the short interval control, again, we're not going through that today, is, is, is about how do you make uh, improvements on the fly in, in the shift. So, so, so the short interval control really becomes like a, a real-time uh, productivity in, improvement tool. So how do you get to along that journey to achieve operational best performance? So the first phase is, as I discussed earlier, you do an assessment, you apply the analytics tool, and then you need to discover what are those items to operate on here. I think the key takeaway from this uh, circular chart, which is a continuous improvement chart, is the section in the middle. And in order to achieve what we've really found to achieve best potential performance, you need to have an improvement team which is established. The improvement team is not just the business improvement guys or the in-house uh, CI guys. You really need them involved, obviously, but also the site-based operations have to be involved completely. And then also the analytics uh, specialists, whether that's in-sourced or outsourced, whatever. So you need to have a team 
like that, which then drives drives the the, the, the decision. So, so having decided what are the areas where we need to focus on, you need to then, as a team, scope the improvement opportunities, develop a plan. So once you've got the plan, that's really the the, the first step. And how do you embed that plan so that it, it it permanently it's a permanent fix? So there's a whole lot of change management which needs to happen there. And then all the way along the cycle, um, you 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 use the analytics just to see that you're moving the needle in the right direction. Um, so so Kurt will go through a little bit of the, the case studies he does. We'll give you an example of that. And then so once you've fixed the first one, then it's a question of doing the analysis all over again. Where is your next uh, lowest hanging fruit, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, let me pass uh, the ball over to, to Kurt uh, and he can talk a little bit more about how we do it with case studies. Thanks, Roger. Um, great intro, I really appreciate that. Um, so depending on, uh, on the author, most articles agree that around 80 to 90% of data insights never lead to a business outcome. So this means that most opportunities found by analysts never achieve their potential. Now, imagine if a mine said that 80 to 90% of discovered material was never dug up. I'm sure there'd be some pretty unhappy shareholders to, to put it mildly. So why is it acceptable for data insights and how do we turn this around? So after working with many mining customers, we've identified some gaps um, and, and developed the process out. When we look at the typical insights from analysts, I ask you to consider in your operations, are they measured and valued right from the start? Then are they prioritized? Are a select few chosen and then driven through a structured process to change management, embedded improvement and reviewed at a later date? Unfortunately, also the silos within large businesses don't collaborate perfectly, as I'm sure we've all experienced, even in the best of times. And so our approach provides an overarching engagement team. This is a team which goes across the silos and follows the processes from the first recognition of an insight through reviewing that outcome, say six to 12 months after the execution. In today's world, we're saturated with data and this has led to being piled with reporting solutions. I know that in most minds have, have invested somehow in, in these. However, maybe it's been a little bit too much at one end of the improvement process and not across the process. So I'll share a couple of examples on how we go about what we do. As Roger mentioned, the examples I'll go through relate to our operate for productivity tools and the processes and the outcomes that include um, getting ahead of emerging problems. So that's like alerting, um, sorry, alerting features that enhance quick decision-making. Um, improving tire wear and machine condition through haul rate analytics and truck data, uh, reducing operating costs through utilization. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, I noticed uh, we spoke to that. Um, downtime, another really interesting thing around operational costs is idle time analytics. How much time is that machine idling? It looks like it's doing something because there's hours coming through on it, but is it actually being productive um, in the right way? Also increased productivity through the development of dynamic operational strategies. Um, improve operator safety and efficiency. Obviously, that's a big one. Um, through the range of metrics relating to crew and operator performance designed to find opportunities within the loading and hauling operations uh, and effective strain change strategies, uh, where we work with site personnel to ensure that change is delivered where it's needed and when and as smoothly as possible. Um, that can be a challenge. That's, the, that's the, what we're trying to break through. Once we have the insights, we evaluate the opportunity and prioritize it using a value driver tree tool with complex what if profitability analysis. So that this ensures the opportunity is measured and aligned to business goals, to mine plans and achieving the best potential performance for any circuit. So we, our, our specialists go in and work with the client and move a bunch of levers within the value driver tree. And then we go to, and that, that's great as a technical level, but it's really built out detailed and a lot of content in it. Taking that and, and that automatically produces sort of what you can see on the screen there, where you get things like a waterfall chart or an outlook and see how that's going to affect the future for that business. And this particular one is a profit or loss per ton. This can be put on um, costing. This can be put on the, 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 the revenue side of it. This can be put, but usually people try to drill in a little bit more. They look at downtime. They look at um, specific cost areas, and that sort of thing but you've got to keep in mind that overarching profit or loss per ton. Um, 
moving right ahead. So this one, I know you've sort of seen this slide before, but this is about the application of it. Um, so in terms of payload variability, and where we start is by doing this rapid assessment. Um, it's only a simple example of the process that Rob, Roger described earlier, whereby every truck and shovel circuit has some degree of variability. Um, and this is about a site that was suffering from inconsistent payloads on a fleet of Komatsu 930s, uh, which is a pretty common model. So firstly, in our rapid assessment, we defined the customer's overarching problem, which was there was an average payload below target payload of 290 tonnes. So site equipment and um, site conditions, and there was data to be reviewed, and this all led to the analytics side for us. This is where a variation in payload was identified and confirmed a wide distribution. Importantly, when increasing payload though, I think I might've mentioned it earlier, we don't, what we don't wanna do is increase overloading. So focusing on variability to, to push it up in, that, in those central areas, that, that 100 to 105 bucket or 105 to 110 bucket, where there's no truck damage, but we're making the most of those machines on site. Um, our next step was to focus on developing out the actual insights. So interestingly, when we broke it down, all the data, the truck payload variation was found to be generally um, quite different between the load unit operators. Um, I mean, it's, it, this isn't um, unsurprising. This is something that we have hunches of, but it's about measuring it. It's about throwing these sort of numbers into that value driver tree, working out, is this something that we can chase or not? And then at the start, and then yes, this is a this is a viable project and chasing it. And that leads us into this, what we're talking about here. From there, we scoped the opportunities. So we went to site and discussed the difference between the operators and record the strategies used by different leading operators. Uh, those top two or maybe three, really the top two in that situation. Um, now that led to the improvement plan. So working with these leading operators on site, we developed a load unit operator training um, course to ensure consistency across the crews because uh, there was a big difference. I know we haven't highlighted the crew difference here, but there was a, a large difference between the crews. So it's a culture thing as well. And how you can affect that is it can be challenging, but that's that's what we specialize in. So this goes on to the execution. So from this work, training was delivered in mid-January of last year, which resulted in the embedding stage. Now, the refresher training then had to come into about March of 2021, I think, and regular progress reports were run to ensure that the improvement continued. And this led to the sustained imp performance improvement. So as you can see in the graph there down the bottom, the average payload exceeded the target and achieved that the average target, of, not only achieved the average target, but was nearly 300 tonnes, which ended up actually being a 7% increase in tonnes per shift, not just because of payload, because they were actually turning the trucks over less often because they were using the load unit to fill the trucks instead of waiting for that next truck to come in. They were filling the trucks a little bit more. Considering that this required no capital investment, that's a fantastic improvement in productivity, which for this side, I think meant um, an overall increase in profitability of around 14 million per annum, um, which is extremely encouraging uh, without, like I said, that capital investment, which I try to avoid at all costs. So the next one for us. Is, so Kurt, maybe I'll just interrupt yep. you there i know you quoted 14 million um improvement uh maybe you can just talk the currency here because we talk brands uh, I think you talk australian uh, dollars yeah. and the world talks us dollars <laughs> yeah so, so i think that's, of magnitude that's difference roughly um 10 million us i'm going to say off the top of my head um or a little bit more um this is a, a massive difference you know it um I'm not sure what the RAND conversion is, sorry, Roger, um, but considerable. You know, we're talking, with that savings, you can buy another three, three uh, load units, large load units, shovels I'm talking about, so, um, or close to, yeah. That, so that, that's a huge, huge number um, for something that just needed a bit of time taken. Um, and, it, and I mean time, it, this is not something that you go to, you open up, your, your latest spreadsheet or, 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 or whatever analytics tool that people use, because um, there's a lot out there. Um, and just seeing a number going out saying, here it is, let's change, and expecting change to just occur, just because the numbers add up to, and it makes sense to us in the office, doesn't mean it, that, it, that it instantly just is deployable. 
it needs to be embedded, it needs to be translated to like a training package like that was just then, or um, maybe it's a machine setup. Uh, quite often changing the settings of machine pump pressures and that sort of thing. So it's, um, oh, uh, Blair, Blair has put in there 156 million <laughs> rand. Very good, very good. Um, thanks, Blair. Um, excellent. So next point um, is, is around not just Kate, um, point around KPIs and how they drive adverse outcomes. So as Roger mentioned that the site that we were looking at focused heavily on truck payload instead of focusing on the performance of the overall circuit, similarly to focusing on the profitability of an overall business unit. Um, it still remained though that the circuit was not achieving planned productivity. So we, we were acknowledged happily that there was an issue on this site. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the next step for us is obviously analytics perform. So that's, that's where we go with every, every time. And when reviewing the operations, it wasn't payload that we believed was a cause of low productivity. Instead, we noticed the high queue times suggesting that the load unit was the constrained asset. And so we explored how to make the load unit more effective as opposed to just focusing on the trucks and the payload and, and that side. Uh, me. Next step for us, um, actionable insights again. So when focusing on the load unit, we look towards a metric called instantaneous dig rate. You hear me say metric. I love metrics because it takes a whole lot of metrics to build up a picture, to paint the picture of profitability and productivity for a mine site. Focusing on one thing like that truck payload as a KPI can be dangerous. Obviously, we want to fill the trucks as much as possible. That last um, case study really pointed that out. But if we will look at this as a metric, so this instantaneous dig rate is a measure of tons per hour when the load unit is actually digging and dumping into the back of the truck. This number measures the effectiveness of the load unit. And we can see in this case, 7223 or 7,223 tons per hour up the top there. I don't know if you can see my mouse there, but in that top square there, also on this page though, we can see that there's no, it doesn't appear to be a strategy for pass counts because the number of loads done with three passes is really similar to the number of loads done at four passes. <clears throat> Load unit instantaneous dig rate though, when we look down at this, we can split out that on the three pass loads, they're doing 8,200 tons per hour when that machine's digging and dumping versus 6,517. That is an enormous number change and anyone can see that and, and foresee that the, the outcome if you so I'll, I'll go you through the process sorry so that the scoping of improvement opportunities there is the next step so a change of strategy had to be created for load unit operators here and so we evaluated the opportunity and moved to the next big step which is the improvement plan this is where we planned out how we will deliver the strategy to operators and it looks, this, it looks very simple at first, just do three passes, but we all know that you can't just throw something simple out. Everything's a bit more complicated than that. But we pass on the strategy that to only go to four passes if the truck can A, take a full load, and B, when there's a queue. If there's no queue, you fill that truck to maximum capacity. And this takes time to embed, just like any, any um, major benefit. So... <clears throat> That's when it comes to execution. Um, the, so the strategy was then delivered with shovel operators at pre-start meetings in June. And then we embedded the improvement. And that was done through refresher discussions in July and regular progress reports. These regular progress reports, you might've heard me mention them in the last case study as well. They're vital as they provide measurement of success. And as the old saying goes, if you, you can't manage what you can't measure. And then finally, they reached sustained performance improvement. As you can see, this concluded with all crews consisting, um, pardon me, consistently achieving a 10% long-term improvement. For this business, that meant avoiding the purchase of an additional load unit and associated trucks to achieve their targets, which translated, I'm going to say, to about 150 to 200 million rand um, dollar saving for that business, roughly. So the, the, the associated cost saving for this business was that kind of money. So sometimes we look for opportunities where we can increase productivity. Other times there's, there's factors whereby there's constraints, if you like. Um, and sometimes market 
situations dictate they don't want to increase productivity they want to save money and in this situation it was about saving money how can they not purchase that extra shovel and load units once again avoiding the capital outlay where we can that doesn't mean we always avoid a capital outlay um, that does happen from time to time um, but but certainly going through that process is a real advantage and those are case studies done so I'll hand back to Roger. Thanks for all your patience with me coughing there before. And um, and I'll, yeah, hand over to Roger. Okay, great. Now, thanks, Kurt. Those were really interesting. Trust everyone on the webinar found them uh, equally interesting. Um, so really just to sum up, uh, you know, what we've said today, and I'd really like to just keep this, keep this simple because I'm really passionate about the opportunity here in the mining space. So there is 250 billion US dollars lost annually uh, lost productivity annually in in the mining space uh, and we're talking about the mining space being probably about uh, 1.8 trillion dollars that's a figure of about 17 to 20 percent i think of the total value so there's a huge amount of of lost productivity uh, i know mines are maybe you know pretty profitable now many of them, them are given commodity prices i think it varies across the commodities but I mean, this is money which is just just being wasted. And then when when things get tough again, you know, it's it's it, it is really difficult to improve things. Then the other thing is there's multiple factors which uh, impact load and haul performance. Lots and lots of them. And I think the key thing here is using analytics to find those areas to focus on. So don't just decide we're going to focus on you know, speed on cycle, or we're going to focus on this or focus on the other thing. It's, it's a question of doing the analytics in each specific area. And I think Kurt made a good, uh, made a, some good comments on the last slide, really saying you might want to just be trying to reduce your cost because there's no point in increasing your productivity because you're producing iron ore, which in South Africa is going down the, um, the iron ore line to, um, to Saldana and there's only so much capacity that Transnet has got and only so much capacity you can use. So in that particular case, how do you optimize, reduce costs, add more profit to the business? And I think, so once you've uh, got those areas that you're addressing and focused on, uh, then it's a really a highly collaborative engagement is needed uh, using change management. So that consists of a large team. It's not just a small business improvement group. It's everyone involved in the operations. So I think that's really where we'd like to leave it. We've got uh, about five more minutes or so. Uh, but I'll just, if you remember one thing from the presentation today, I'd just like you to remember $250 billion lost annually uh, in productivity in the mining space. Um, and, and Formula One is a much, much smaller business. It's a, a, a thousandth the size. And it, you know, works really, really well with analytics and delivers, you know, you know, delivers real value to them. So, you know, the mining industry should really be the industry showing the F1 guys on what you can do with analytics. So, okay, so I'll just, just leave it there. Um, maybe, Kurt, if there's any questions in the, the chat, um, maybe before we, we, we look, look at questions. So there are my uh, contact details. Um, welcome to contact me at, at, at any time. We've also got a, a LinkedIn uh, site. So if you go and look for Dakota on LinkedIn, you know, follow us. We do put things up there from time to time. And then if there's any attendees on here, if you'd like us to, you know, take a, a, a look at, you know, your, your operations using analytics and do some sort of um, proof of concept in O4P, please just give, give give us give us a shout we'd, we'd, we'd love to do something like that with you okay so any questions in the um, in the q and a no open questions there no um, a point uh, interesting also will be considered the amount of jobs lost as a result of these inefficiencies um, absolutely um, if we can make mining a more profitable business unit um, through increased productivity and, and, and better practices on site, you know, that it, it makes mining more attractive. Um, a huge focus, even though it's hard to do sometimes through analytics, but a huge focus of ours is safety as well um, and conditions for people. Um, you know, we, we want not only jobs, we want safe jobs. So it's, it's a really, really he um, healthy point, that one from Alec. And um, I think that's all from 
questions. Um, okay. I don't, one more, sorry. Thank you. Um, we need to change the trade-off mindset for value creation in the long run. I could not agree more. Um, you know, I think um, I probably said sustained improvement through that presentation quite a few times. Um, it has to be sustainable. It's no point. I think every mind site has seen um, an idea come through. Every business has seen an idea come through whereby it makes sense then and there. It makes sense today, but in the long run, does it? And, and we, quick, we quickly chase that quick dollar as opposed to saying, how do we make this business, this mindset, this circuit, this operation um, sustainable long term? How do we make it safe? How do we make it profitable? And um, yeah, so really valid point there. Thank you. Um, right. Roger, sorry, I just talked all through them. Did you want to mention anything there, mate? No, no, I think uh, you, you, you've covered that there, Kurt. So that's that, that's great, and thanks thanks for those uh, valuable comments. So, guys, we've got technically uh, four minutes left now. So I think it's probably a, a good good time to you know to to stop the discussion. So um, maybe Gugu, um, the the post webinar survey. Uh, if we could just ask everyone just to complete that. It's just four very quick questions. And Google, is that going to um, pop up on the screen here, or is it? Uh, will it be emailed afterwards? I'm quite not sure yeah. how that how that works. Just after so. the webinar, uh, sorry, Roger. Just after we end it, it will pop up on the screen for the attendees. Okay, so just stay stay on the webinar, and as we end it, it's going to pop on the screen for you. So, so again, I, you know, really appreciate your time to to listen to us. Um, you know, as I said in the beginning, everyone just sits in front of a computer all the time and have done for the last two years, and now you voluntarily sitting in front of a meeting. So we do really appreciate your attendance. And, and again, if there's anything, any anyone is interested in what we've discussed, please reach out uh, and, 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 and contact me. So thank you. And thanks. Uh, and thanks for, for, for your inputs there, Kurt. Go ahead, no worries, thank you. So okay. I did, um, I skipped over one. I should have come to, um, someone asked about some of the content. If they can get a copy of it, please reach out either the three details in the questionnaire or contact Roger. As you can see, his details yeah. on the screen there now. So, Yeah, um, and thanks. I think uh, Gugu did say that the webinar was recorded. So I think it's available post um, webinar. Is that correct, Gugu? That is correct. Uh, would you like us to share the recording with the attendees? Uh, yeah, I'm happy with that. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah, thanks. All right. Great. Okay, very guys. Good. You know, uh, th th thanks very much again. And uh, yeah, you have a great, great day. Uh, safe day further. Take care. Thank you, everyone.